Hello and welcome to Russell Walker Meets on Glasgow Chamber of Commerce TV. Many businesses are fighting for their survival as the effects of the coronavirus pandemic continue to bite. Charities too are facing having to tighten their belts just at the time their services are needed most. My guest today is the Deputy Director of Aberlour Child Care Trust, the largest Scottish children's charity. They've seen a huge increase in the numbers of people applying for their urgent assistance fund. So I'm delighted to welcome Liz Nolan to the show. And Liz, how badly affected has Aberlour been by the pandemic? What we've seen is a significant increase in the number of referrals that we've received for families who are in desperate need out there. We've also seen a significant reduction in the development opportunities that we've been able to take on board. So we had planned for developments, so new developments within our residential care sector um, to progress this year. And of course, they've all stopped. Our fundraising teams, of course, aren't able to go out and, and speak to, to funders. And um, so we've potentially seen a significant decrease in, in the fundraised income that we're able to bring into the organisation, which then directly impacts on the work that we're able to then do with the support that we provide to children and families. So what so, impact does that have directly then? So the, the fundraised income that comes in to Aberlour is directly to support children and families. So that means that we will have a reduction in the family support provision that we're able to provide, a reduction in the amount of services that we're able to provide right across the country. Um, so that will directly impact on children and families, meaning that they are potentially left without services that they will desperately need when this pandemic ends. Just explain in, in easy to understand terms, Liz, if you would, what that practically means to these families. So, for example, our urgent assistance fund, we had an urgent assistance fund prior to the pandemic and we had many applications from across the country coming in from families who were struggling, who couldn't afford, you know, the basic items for their household. What we've seen is an 1100% increase in those applications coming into us since the pandemic and, and the coronavirus has hit families. We've seen, you know, families who had been in employment prior to coronavirus, who are now out of work, who are struggling to make ends meet, who are struggling to provide food, gas, electricity, heating, clothing for their children and families. So, I mean, we've had 644 applications into Aberlour since the crisis began. That's on top of the family support work that we do across the country, um, you know, from Dumfries and Galloway up to, to Murray across to, to Forth Valley. So this is on top of all of that family support that we see. But the applications that are coming in are for families who not just need monetary support, they also need practical support. You know, they are left without families around them to provide that support. They're left, you know, we are seeing an increase in domestic abuse cases. We're seeing an increase in neglect cases. So it's all of this practical support that families will need now and they'll continue to need in the future. And if we don't have that fundraised income, then we're unable to provide that family support provision to a lot of families across the country. Now, we have been provided with some money from Scottish Government. Scottish Government gave us £100,000 towards our urgent assistance fund. We have had other funding um, from other sources and other businesses who supported us. But the level that we are giving that money out at is unsustainable. So for families in the future, if this continues to go on, that pot of money, that urgent assistance fund, is going to, to reduce quite significantly. But the needs of these families is going to continue far into the future. We're talking about families who have lost their jobs, whose children have been out of school for a significant amount of time, who haven't been able to keep up with the, the level of work that their, their peers or their counterparts are able to, to continue to because they perhaps have the equipment, have the additional electricity that's needed in order for them to maintain and sustain their educational attainment. For families where they were already just surviving, they were on the edge of that cliff and, and COVID-19 is about to tip them over, we were that urgent medium and stopped them. We were able to prevent them from falling over that cliff. But we're, we don't have the capacity to support every single family that's going to need it when we go into the future. And that's why we desperately need 
additional funding to come in to provide this long-term sustained family support for families. You are painting a pretty bleak picture. The applications that we get in to our urgent assistance fund are bleak. They are horrific. This is families who are having to come to an organisation who prior to this had they had no dealings with charities where they have had no money to provide food for their children. They are having to wait five weeks for universal credit in order for them to be able to survive. And within that five weeks, what we're trying to do is to support families just to survive. So families where they don't have a washing machine, so um, they don't have the means to support their children, you know, through the very, very basics with food, the extra electricity that comes with children not being at school, trying to keep their children entertained and, and, and give them something to do. Um, during the long days of, of this lockdown and it is there are some desperate desperate cases that we are seeing. How much money is coming in and what are you doing with it? Since the lockdown began we have given out a, over £130,000 to children and families directly to them 100% of all of the money that we bring in through to our urgent assistance fund goes back out to families. Um, so we know that every single penny that people donate into us is going directly to families to support them. You're a lifeline to a lot of these families. It must be absolutely heartbreaking to know that actually you can't do what you're there to do. Yeah, and, and it is, it, it's, it's a horrific um, scenario that we're in where, and, and reading through all of these applications, and that's from, from families who hadn't struggled before, but actually, you know, all of a sudden, within the blink of an eye, everybody, you know, people had lost their jobs, they weren't able to afford the things that they had been able to afford the week before, they were surviving with what they were having to pay back in, you know, arrears or in loans or in credit payments, but then all of a sudden, that was all taken away, and, and they weren't able to do anything, so we are a definite lifeline. Um, for children and families across Scotland and that lifeline needs to continue long beyond um, the coronavirus situation because these families will be in um, as this situation far into the future. The burden is also on your workers, how are they coping? Yes, so th they've been doing really well. We're, as an organisation we are so proud of the workers. We, we keep in regular contact with all of our workers. Our residential services for children and young people who can't be at home, they of course have had to remain open. They're fully open so they're our children so we, our staff are in there looking, looking after them and they've done amazing work 24-7. We haven't closed any of those services are needed to the staff. We're just working really, really hard to maintain those relationships and to support the young people that we care for. Our short breaks services for children with disabilities have had to reduce down but we've we've kept our doors open because we're very aware that actually this is the real time that families do need some overnight respite support um, but what we've had to do is to reduce that down to only have single children in because of the social distancing measures that we have to maintain. Our family support services, we have continued to do some face-to-face -face work with families where it's absolutely needed, where there are protection con concerns. And I said earlier about rising domestic abuse cases. So where we have significant concerns for children and families, we have continued to provide face-to-face -face direct practical work. And then also digital work where we're connecting with families through WhatsApp or, or Zoom. Um, or one of those other means that you can connect with families. Again, out in the communities, practically supporting families through shopping, getting electric and gas top up for cars where they can't get out and about um, and do their own shopping or, or they haven't got the funds or the means to do it. So we've been able to provide the funding, but also the practical support that goes alongside that. What are you hearing from the front line in terms of the actual stories that they're, they're yeah. facing? So I suppose on, on two levels, it, it's the additional crises that, that our families are finding themselves, all of that support that needs to go on, but also our staff are anxious about being out and about, you know, having to be out there when none of us know who's going to be infected or affected by um, coronavirus. So they're placing themselves out there supporting families. They're, they're out there trying to continue to do the best that they can do 
plus they have all of the anxieties that other people have um, who are out there. So it's, it's, it's double edged almost in that they're trying to support families who they know are in desperate need, but also they have their own anxieties. And as an organization, I think we've done extremely well supporting our staff. We haven't furloughed any staff and um, we've tried to maintain all of our staffing and of course, because we're very much aware that, you know, this could impact on any one of us, you know, that, that loss of a job, that loss of earnings, that has a huge impact for everyone. So as an organization, we've taken that, that we, we haven't furloughed any staff. So all of our staff are working either in residential care, doing exactly as they did prior to that, or being innovative um, and, and working in different ways with, with children and families or helping out wherever they can. What do you think the likely consequences are I don't know, six months down the line? We don't know what's going to happen, but what we're seeing is the immediate impact of family, to children and families who were already struggling, um, who were already in poverty, and actually that is now being compounded. You know, families who are isolated, an increase in mental health issues where they, they don't have the same means as, as perhaps other families who haven't been as affected by, you know, that monetary loss, that loss of jobs. Um, and isolation for families where they don't have the mechanisms to get out and about into the fresh air and do all the things that, that they see other families doing, that will have a long-term long impact on families. The impact on children's attainment at school is another key worry for us about children who hadn't had the same um, access to the, to the equipment that perhaps their peers did, and, and that's going to have a long-term impact as well. So just, I don't know in six months time where we're going to be, but for us, it is a significant concern that actually family support and support to families um, and for families needs to be a long-term investment. And, and we need to be there so that families can come to us as their lifeline because that this isn't going to go away. So they need to be able to come to organizations like Aberlour um, and, and ask for that support because it takes huge effort and huge courage to actually come out and actually ask for that support. And when families do ask for that support, we need to have services that are there ready and able to take up um, and support those families. You're talking about long-term funding coming. And then when I ask you where it's coming from, you, you, you've said a couple of times, we get funding from the Scottish Government, we get money from the big lottery fund, we get money from local authorities. I, I'm, I'm, I'm almost hesitant to ask you this, but the fact that you're saying we get that money, but we need long-term funding, is there a hint there that you're, you're fearful that they are going to pull that funding at any point? That's always a risk that, that our funding you know, won't continue on beyond. A, a lot of our funding is year-to-year -year funding. So we don't actually know where funding is coming from in a year's time um, and, and whether we're going to be around. Um, so when I talk about long-term sustained funding, it's about we need to go beyond that yearly funding that we currently get in order for us to, to be able to say we're, we're here for the long term. We're here, um, you know, and, and we're sticking with children and families um, across the country because that has always been an issue, that short-term funding um, for organisations such as Aberlour, where where we don't know beyond that one sometimes up to three years where that funding is going to come from beyond that time. Can you speculate as to how long it might take you to get back to normal after the lockdown is, is eased and then finally lifted? We're, as, a, as an organisation, we're already looking at what that next stage will look like. We have um, risk assessed our face-to-face -face, um, services. So where we, as I said earlier, where we go out and we're still meeting with families where it's safe to do so, where we have considerable concerns. So our next stage is about looking at what potential smaller group work will look like, how we get our family support services back up um, out into the communities where they need to be, and also our short break services, potentially how we start to, to look at safe distancing in different ways and perhaps open on, on different nights. So we're already on um, that journey journey um, internally and then we'll have to look at and risk assess what that next stage will look like. You're one of 1200 or so uh, members of the Glasgow Chamber of Commerce. Is it good to have that kind of family around you? Yes I think so and, and 
that's what I said. We, we've had great support from, from a number of businesses and donors who've been able to, to help us out when we've needed, needed this support and when we've been able to go out and then directly provide that support um, and that input out to children and families directly. So, yes, it's, it's always good to be part of, of the family, as you say.